Okay, uh, first thing I want to say is, yes, I do look a bit scruffy. I'm actually growing what, what I call my Spanish beard. Um, and my hair, I actually have to go to the barber. You probably notice it's actually growing back. Um, so I, I do need my uh, January shearing um, to happen at the local barbers. But anyway, a few things to cover. First thing is I've got some items that I'm not going to review now but we'll be reviewing soon. One's an in-car um, dash cam, underwater, uh, what do you call it, light system for your GoPro, which isn't just for underwater, it's good for night as well. And my MyCloud, which is my personal cloud, and I've also got a MyBook, um, which is where I store all my data. Uh, but I'm not gonna talk about it too much, I just don't want you going, Matt, what's that in behind you? <laughs> so we're going to talk about business today and business relating to wherever you are. Um, the first thing I want to say is relating to people retiring and how they often get things wrong. Um, <coughs> opening a bar, for example, is often done because people have sat as a customer in a bar, but the connection between the hours and the problems that come with running a bar aren't really covered. So they don't really look at it from a business point of view. They're looking at it, they've sat behind the bar on a Friday for the last 15 years and it seems nice. They don't think about the drayman coming at seven, eight o'clock in the morning and you're getting, it bed, getting to bed at half past 12 every night. Um, dealing with the promotion, dealing with the staff issues, dealing with trying to keep everything flowing, and the brewery often bleeding the thing dry. They don't really talk about that. Um, so they don't look at it from that perspective because it's not the bit that gets promoted. You need to talk to people in the industry to understand those things because um, I could do an entire video on that. I've done bars myself. I've, I've uh, run bars, I've run restaurants, and I... I've done it on quite a large basis. Um, I can cover it some other day because it's, it's too expansive. But what we're talking about today is the fact that many people will go into a business they have no knowledge or experience in. Um, going to the Philippines and Spain, um, pretty much anybody is moving to another country and they're not making money uh, online or have a good pension fund or something. They're going to be looking to make money. And one of the things they do is they, there is often a pattern of where people go wrong. Um, there's a guy here, I'll be honest with you, I dislike him. <laughs> uh, he sold the same bar at least six times now, bar and restaurant. Because I think he sells it on a lease. And then what happens is he then buys the lease back at a reduced rate and then sells it on there to somebody else or basically the people giving the keys back because they're losing money. He knows he doesn't make any money, but he owns the actual building, he owns the restaurant, he owns the bar, and just keeps selling it and selling it. And I've seen it change six times in the last two years. Something to be very aware of, because that's how a lot of breweries make their money, on the pub side. Because obviously, supermarket stock beer now, uh, when the breweries and everything went full swing, it was all on the tap, it was all fresh, but then somebody invented tss, tss, good beer out of a can, and the industry has been on decline ever since. So you've got to be aware of that. But also, if you've never worked in that industry, why would you want to open a bar? I've been watching this Bargain Brits thing, and you can YouTube it. They've got uh, two series of it. Um, online, there's a, the old last year's and this year's it's got like uh, the first couple of episodes on there, but you can see the majority of people are on there are either not making a lot of money or they're from specific things some of it's to do with bars, some of it's to do with campsites, some of it's to do with the um, cabaret and the entertainment industry, but they're specifically orientated around tourism and that's the thing. You may be changing your entire outlook on life. And 
you may be better off doing the adventure and calculations and understanding what you need to make every month and how you're going to make it before you even leave where you are now. Uh, for example, if you wanted to teach salsa dancing, I mean, I know here there must be a market for dancing. Um, Colin, uh, that actually, and Colin was on one of these shows. Um, we're actually now Facebook friends. Um, he teaches dancing. Um, he he had uh, he come to Spain originally, had a good income, etc., etc., and then something went wrong, um, and he was left with just his pension, which basically covered his rent. So he started teaching lessons on dancing and stuff, and he's built a business up from that. So you have to understand that when you're looking at opening a business, especially overseas, you've got to have the drive and ambition to make it work. Don't assume it's just going to open. Don't assume that you can just give somebody the keys and think that these people are cheap. Um, they'll run it all, and I just sit here sipping on pina colada or whatever. Uh, because what will happen is the word bankrupt will come around because you have to find people you can trust. Don't assume you can trust people because the worst thing you can do is give people trust at day one. Now, it takes time to develop, but it also takes time to develop systems to protect yourself. In a restaurant, for example, you get managers and bar staff or the chefs bringing in their own food, cooking it, and then selling it. Um, you're not even aware this is going on if you're not on the premises because they don't run it through the cash register because they're doing it as if it was their business and running it through on cash sales. I've seen it on bars where they're running extra pumps. Um, a friend of mine was asked to take over a bar many moons ago um, in Worcester. Now, it turned over X amount of alcohol, um, but for the brewery, they actually paid, the brewery actually paid him to run the bar because they needed to keep it open because the last person had been thrown out. Um, and a bar that's operational is easier to sell. So he was in there and basically he was bringing beer from his other bar. Uh, I'm not talking one or two barrels. I'm talking about three quarters of the alcohol drank on that premises did not go through the accounts of the brewery. They were coming straight from his pub and being pushed through there. Coming from cash and carry, straight through there. A lot of the stuff was not even hitting the tax. It was all completely invisible because nobody was interested in the operation of the place, uh, including himself. He wasn't buying it. Um, and nobody was monitoring what he was doing. So he was doing them a favor by looking after it for them in his viewpoint. So he made some good money on that. Now, that's a prime example of somebody taking over your business and could do exactly the same. Um, it's not difficult to do. It's not difficult to be ripped off. The easy bit is finding an expat that has money and time to invest in something they don't understand or know very well. Um, they just need to be coerced into parting with that cash. Now, what businesses to look for? Now, for myself, I'm moving away from doing stuff hands-on. I was talking to Jay today from Real Deal relating to an idea I've had um, to do with the English teaching stuff, where I'm going to invest 20 hours a week for about the next six weeks to boost it up. Um, there's going to be a separate income revenue for that um, because the idea being is that is going to pay for a mortgage on another property here. And the reason that one is viable is quite simply, I'll hit it hard and put a lot of effort and time into it initially, and then I'm going to do nothing. It will go down to like one hour a week. Um, because once all the initial work's done, it will start feeding on a regular basis. Um, but I can't really discuss it too much because I haven't started it yet. I'm still working on it. But the point being is, these things are possible. And the good thing about that, it's global. I don't have to sit in an office or something that costs me rent, electric, um, tax rates, and everything else. It's all done from here. 
So that's a new ongoing thing that is going to be developing. Opening your premises, you need to understand what the local rules and regulations are. Because, back to Bargain Brits, uh, the TV show, there was a woman there, a businesswoman, set up a campsite and the local government closed it down because it's one square meter under what a campsite is technically allowed to be. So it was no longer a campsite because it's one square meter under. She then had it remeasured and showed that it was actually over that, but they then spent ages and snaps. I'm not even aware if they've actually agreed to let her open the doors again, but that is the sort of bureaucracy you get. You need to understand the issues locally. It's why <coughs> me and Igor were talking, Igor's the, my friend here who does the renovations and construction work. Um, he's got another project he's looking at at the moment to buy this big lot of land. Uh, it's not huge, it's um, about 13,000 square meters. Um, but he's smart enough to go, I'll get a lawyer next to where the mayor's office is. Because in Spain, the mayors have a lot of power. The Philippines, the mayor has a lot of power. The UK, not so much. You still have local bylaws and stuff that uh, the local council deal with. Um, but it's not as bad as trying to deal with things in the Philippines or Spain where a lot of the central government control doesn't exist in what you're doing. <coughs> so you need to understand what goes into that location, what hassles you're likely to get, who's going to create a problem for you. Is there a way to hit it off with them at day one so you can push them to one side because they're not bothered about you. Now in the Philippines, I'll be honest with you, if your business is small, they're not going to bother you too much unless you've got neighbors that are jealous or have an issue with you in some way um, because then you have the the bamboo telegraph where somebody will report you for whatever they can and they've got a relative that works in the mayor's office and then you have a problem getting a permit and you get a problem getting your uh, fire certificate whatever it is because of politics you need to be aware these things happen and plan for it um, so this is even before you've even got your business idea. This is before you've even thought, you know what, this is what I want to be doing. Because you need to understand that you're going to have problems. As soon as you've got problems, you just list out, get a bit of paper, list down what you think may be a problem in that location. Try and speak to other people in that area to get an idea of any hassles they've had. Um, in the UK, we call it doing lunch. We, you take somebody um, to lunch that can chirp like a uh, canary uh, to give you information. They're not going to give you anything of business advantage to you over your competitors. Well, actually, it's giving you the general information of stuff that they've learned over the time. Uh, for example, maybe the uh, sewers flood when it rains, you know, these sort of things that you would not be aware of when you arrive there and it's all sunny and nice. Those are the things that can make a big difference on a business because if you open in the uh, rainy season, you could suddenly find that day one it's flooded. So just it's worth the investment and in understanding where the business is. It's worth spending time looking at the people that use that area, the people that access the, the type of business you're setting up, what road routes is there, what, what is going to make your business a success. You've got to ask yourself, what do you think will make this work? Also, turn around and ask somebody else to ask you. Ask a few people to ask you and what they, they think about the ideas. Because you're trying to limit risk and increase the opportunities and chances of success. And that comes from research. If you're opening the bar next to another bar, what's going to make your bar better than their bar? That's a simple one. If you're buying an existing business and it's busy when you went there on Friday night, 
I recommend going there Monday afternoon, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Spend as much time as you can in there because you'll find when it's off peak. Because it may just be busy on a Friday night because everyone comes in from work, got paid, spend all the money, then go home and got no money for the following week. These are the things you're looking for. Now, next thing is supply. Supply of goods is a problem in some countries and others not. Uh, Philippines is improving. Uh, it used to be quite bad for getting things like uh, imported alcohols of, of certain types. Also, um, things like dough for making food. You know, some things were awkward to get hold of, um, but often, often can be time sensitive in the sense that you can't bulk buy them things because they, they spoil. So there's a lot of things that you need to evaluate. Have you got access to the right supply? Next thing, is it the right price? Are you going to get the goods you want at the right price? And is there going to be another issue? For example, if you ramp up, will it be able to supply you? Or are you going to need two or three suppliers? Is it worth getting two or three suppliers if you're opening a bigger place to try and get them to compete off each other and get a lower price between them? All these things is stuff you evaluate. And like I said, this is before you even got to the business idea. And this is why I've sort of pushed aside when somebody goes, Matt, what business do you recommend? The answer is, what business do you think or know you can do? Um, for example, here, I recommend air conditioning. Um, doing air conditioning to European standards because a lot of people don't. Um, they're using the wrong pipe work. Let's just call it they're not installing them properly and they certainly ain't maintaining them. And because they have a lack of knowledge on how the systems work, they may advise you to change the whole system when it just needs new seals and regassing. Now, if you're good at what you do, invest a bit of money in yourself and make the uh, grade becoming qualified and skilled at what you do I think there's a business here in Spain for doing that I don't I'm not just about literally where I am but in other parts of Spain um, but the point is I was trying to get away from actually giving people business ideas uh, not because I'm being negative but quite simply I think people need to sit and think these through things through themselves because it, if you go in the Philippines island to island is very different but even province to province on the same island have different skills Mindanilia where my wife comes from is famous for its tailors if you go to Manila they know the tailors and tail uh, seamstresses come from Mindanilia they're famous for it Karkar is famous for leather shoemaking there's different areas have different skill sets and this is the thing, sometimes it's worth evaluating what is in the area, but also can you pry somebody away from there to go and work in your place, whatever you're doing. You know, for example, your shoemaking, shoe repair shop, whatever. And you think, well, I'm in Cebu City or I'm in Manila. Can I get somebody to come and make the shoes? Um, there is that thing where you can actually get people that have the right skills to start with. Or the other thing is, if you're not experienced, you can't pass on knowledge you have never gained. Um, so you then become reliant on skills that other people have that you don't have, which has obvious risks. Like if they quit, if they quit and opened up another store next door to yours, while you're still trying to recruit a replacement, they're taking all your business. Um, yeah. Employee royal, uh, loyalty is often a problem as well, depending on how big the business is. If it, in the Philippines, if it's a small business, it's very common for somebody to train somebody and then they set up, uh, for example, a barbecue station. You've got a successful barbecue station, you train somebody how to do it, and they'll open one right next to you. Literally, right next to you. Um, I've, I've actually read in a newspaper where people... Um, one of them killed the other one um, over it. But that, that that's an example. And it, that's one of the things in the Philippines. A very small business makes it too easy to replicate. Something a bit more advanced, more complicated, um, requiring more investment, 
you're less likely to have competition. I also think there is a need, especially in Indonesia, for the rising middle classes in the Philippines. Um, a conference center, a restaurant, that sort of thing, I think would work. There's enough businesses that actually want those types of services. Um, and that's why you need to evaluate the area, where you're going to live. But also, what do you want out of it? Are you looking for an income? Are you looking for something to do? Are you looking to have something that doesn't tie you down? Because if you don't want to be tied down, you need to be looking for things online. You need to be looking at things that can be done remotely. Things that, um, if you do open them up, need to be managed, capable of being managed off-site. Um, you don't want to be micromanaging. And this is why you need to spend a lot of time on all this stuff. This is why I haven't done these videos before. It's already 21 minutes and I'm only just covering the very, very basics before I even look at something. Um, but then you've got the budgets. Where do you get your budgets from? What what budget do you need? You've got a bit, you've got to put a budget for the business itself, but then have an emergency budget set aside as well. The emergency budget is for the unforeseen. This is like having um, like a Korean guy had uh, with his uh, computer business. He had the customs guys come in and basically shut his store because they want to bribe every month. Now, that isn't in your business model. But in many countries, it's very common. In Russia, they call it a roof. Uh, basically, a roof in Russia will protect the business. There are normally... Um, they're normally ex-KGB agents, etc., ex-Special Forces, um, that basically will protect your business. They will keep away the gangsters. They'll keep away the problems. Um, in the Philippines, I normally find if you have a good relationship with the mayors, you generally don't have a problem. Um, I haven't come to a location that hasn't been down to the mayor. You know, if somebody's had a situation that's good or bad, the mayor's be, had some input somewhere. Um, if it's good, it's normally, sometimes they're not involved at all. They've got no interest in your business whatsoever. Um, but, yeah, you've just got to be aware. These things are why you have an emergency budget, because things can go wrong quite quickly. Um, and you need to stop the snowball. You need to stop it building up and getting worse and worse. You need to go, right, we need to stop this now. How do we fix it? How do we move forward? How do we sort this mess out and get it running again? Um, so I think that's enough food for thought. Um, I know some people are going to go, well, you didn't really talk about the businesses themselves. We haven't got that far. This is why I haven't really talked about it. It's such an expansive subject that before walking into something, you evaluate everything. I'm looking at a property here in Spain that has a damp issue. But the first thing I noticed when I went in there is it's got no air conditioning, no heating system. It was constructed in 1981 and has never been heated. So instantly I'm thinking, is this a problem with the building or is this a problem with the fact that they only use it in the summertime and it's left empty the rest of the year? Because the damage, it's repairable but bad. But ongoing, how do I make sure it doesn't reoccur? Cause and effect. Doing your due diligence. All the big things that people will say, do your due diligence and this will all be out. But I hope I've covered things a bit more expansive. And I'm not going to cover it too much on this because it's already a long video. But you can leave comments below and I'll expand it out. Um, because I think this gets the conversation started. And then we can discuss things in the comments section and maybe throw in some other videos once people have had a review of this one and thought, well, I want to know about this. So thanks for watching.